like I heard his music one night out there somewhere. He might have been haunting me or something. Look at me. I want to hear him. So he came up there and he was I got a tape There's some of, uh, in Canada that we've heard about, but we haven't been able to. They're on wire. There was an old wire tape, and we don't have anything to play them on. We're ready. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us something about your piece that you're going to play. Well, this is an old Comanche writing song. Uh, Probably that I, the light out. I was fortunate enough to... Um, I was fortunate enough to learn from a, a Comanche lady, and this particular lady is a relative of mine. So the Comanches are real particular of who they give these information to, and, and so uh, I count myself fortunate you know, enough to learn this to write and so And it's, it's a Comanche writing song which is converted into flute music. And uh, uh, I don't think this, well, this particular song is not sung anymore probably by anyone except for me and a few people. That'd be a very few people. Uh -huh. Well, we'll be glad to hear it. It's hard. Hard to play. Uh, this is there. Uh, the Comanche writing song, which is converted into flute music. <laughs> story about it she said she used to hear her mother uh, sing this particular song and when she was a little girl and Eva my relative was a little girl and she often wondered about that uh, tune that uh, and that song that she always uh, heard her mother sing so one day she thought she'd ask uh, where that song come from and how it happened to be in that particular uh, tune that she uh, sung it in so she said well this used to be my father's uh, writing song, and, and as the time passed, and it was converted into flute music, and she heard it uh, played on a flute, and uh, whenever she was doing her daily chore, while well, she used to hum this particular music, and so um, she kept this song for me for several years until um, I began to uh, handle the flute. Uh, good enough, and then I guess she felt it was time to teach me that music, and uh, that's how I learned it. Yeah, this is one I was real. Play one if you would. That way I get to play. I was real lonesome for home when I was in England, and I was out there on a bay in Plymouth, England. So I composed this one particular song. I didn't sing it. An ending, but I'd rather play it on flute because I can't carry a tune on that thing. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you so much. Would you give us your name now and how you can be reached here in the city? Uh, I'm Dr. Tate Nibakoya, and I can be reached on uh, the address of um, Northwest 71st Street, Oklahoma City. Oklahoma. And would you spell that name for us so we'll be sure to get it right? Okay, Nibakoya is N E V A Q U A Y A. In Comanche, uh, the way to pronounce it was Nibakoya. Mm -hmm. Yes. Does it have an, an English meaning that you could translate? Well, it could mean several things. It all depends on how you want to use it. It means that uh, you're tired of being well-groomed, or you're tired of being well-dressed, or you're tired of a young Indian maiden. That's uh, all three different ways. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Uh, how would next two... We got some information about you earlier, but uh, to start, but since it was rather sketchy, I would like to start off by getting your uh, Indian name and your tribe and your uh, your ancestry, a little bit of your genealogical background. Um, my name is uh, um, Joyce Lee Tate Nibiquia. And uh, on my, uh, I'd say my professional name, how I sign my paintings and my work, and and uh, the title I use when I play uh, my flute music, I use Doc Tate Nibiquia, and I come from the Comanche tribe. Uh, it's N E V A Q U A Y A, and the translation in the. Comanches can be, uh, mean uh, three different uh, things, and it all depends on how you want to use it. Uh, Nibiquayup is the way that the Comanches call it. It means that uh, you're a part of young Indian maiden, maidens. And then the second way you can use it is that um, uh, you're part of being uh, pretty, Nibiquayup. Or uh, uh, the way that uh, I see it, for for myself is that uh, uh, you're tired of being well groomed uh, for a man, and uh, the uh, old Indian men when they went to a ceremonial or to a gathering of some sort where they had to uh, uh, be well presented, they took a lot of time in uh, dressing themselves and uh, how they uh, combed their hair and how they parted their hair and they painted. Um, their uh, face and the way the the regalia was uh, put on the buckskin regalia, how they uh, braided their hair and wrapped it with otter skin, and how the uh, ornaments had um, hang hang from uh, their regalia, and how the fringes would uh, uh, flow and lay, and how they would uh, cover themselves with uh, with a blanket that they wore. So it took a lot of uh, time for them to uh, uh, groom themselves. So this is why, I think one of the reasons why that uh, uh, they um, said a Nibi Koyep. Are you, no, you, you're not saying. Uh, the, uh, you're, you're the Comanche tribe, where did, your, where did your ancestors come from? Well, um, I heard a lot of stories about the Comanches, how they had roamed uh, the uh, part of Oklahoma, Texas, clear up into New Mexico, Wyoming, uh, Arizona, and uh, Kansas. And uh, my t particular band, which was called a Fanna band, was uh, located around Texas. I don't know the exact location. But uh, I come from that particular band of Comanches. They say there's around 23 to 27 different bands which roam these this part of the country. Uh, they even uh, claim that the Comanches roamed around the west coast. And uh, uh, the band that I come from was uh, the Fena band. And then gradually in the later uh, 1800s, they were uh, called the Fena uh uh, so I, I come from that part, that particular band. Could you tell about your own parents and their background? 
Um, my uh, my father was named uh, uh, Lynn Nebequia, and uh, my mother was Victoria Wayuki, and uh, uh, my father was was from around Apache, Oklahoma, around in that area, and my mother was also from uh, that area, and they um, uh, were uh, Comanches and were from the uh, Banatuck uh, band of Comanches. Are you full blood? Yes, I'm uh, considered a full blood not Comanche. Full blood, right? Well, not today. Uh, of course, uh, you know, they have a lot of um, uh, Comanches that are mixed with uh, uh, Mexican and Spanish and uh, another tribe so there isn't uh, too many full blood that ex exist uh, today the um, you uh, have quite a number you're you're an artist by profession uh, when did you become interested in art well when i was about in the third grade uh fourth grade uh, i was interested in um, uh, artwork and i have an older brother by the name of malcolm and he always encouraged me to uh, to paint and draw and sketch, and I think that he's one of the uh, uh, people I owe a lot of credit to for encouraging me to uh, uh, sit and uh, paint and sketch. And from there on, I, I become interested in uh, painting, becoming uh, uh, an artist. And then I always admired uh, the Indian artists in that day and time, uh, artists such as uh, Ellen Hauser and A.C. Blue Eagle and uh, Archie Blackall, and these are the artists that I have a lot of respect for, uh, Black Moon Riddles, and uh, with the encouragement, some, I got received some encouragement from, uh, from these artists, and I was influenced by their work. I just more or less got carried away by um, visiting places where they had um, Indian art for exhibit. Did you know A.C. Blue Eagle? Well, I read about him, and um, I heard about him, but every time I was going to meet him, I'd be um, uh, maybe a day late before, uh, uh, a day late after he had left a particular art show or a place where I could have met him. And um, uh, Judy Moore from Dallas, Texas, she was writing a book about A.C. Blue Eagle uh, last year, which was 1972. And uh, she said each time that uh, she uh, uh, made a uh, research on AC Blue Eagle, well, my name would run across uh, and and um, almost duplicate to AC what what uh, what he had uh, done as an artist. And so uh, she decided, well, uh, why not write about an artist uh, that is uh, living and still uh, painting? Uh, and uh, combine it with AC Blue Eagle, and I, I thought that was a great one of the greatest privileges that I ever had as an Indian artist. And uh, AC Blue Eagle, I admired him a lot. What little I uh, know about him, uh, he um, wore regalia at uh, some of the places he had attended, and some of his performance as an artist. And uh, it so happened that uh, I have almost an identical regalia that I wear. And I didn't know this until I began to make a research and study about him. And, and uh, uh, I'm not imitating him whatsoever, but uh, it just uh, happened that way. And Judy Moore become uh, interested in this. And uh, I, I just admired uh, some of our... Uh, what is the name of the book? Well, um, she's still working on it. And it's going to be about uh, an American Indian artist. And it's going to be about um, uh, A.C. Blue Eagle and Doc Tate Nebequia, which I consider myself real fortunate. Is uh, A.C. Blue Eagle considered to have been the greatest of the Oklahoma Indian artists? Well, um, I really don't know. I think he's considered one of the greatest of the Oklahoma Indian artists. Of course, they had several that was recognized as a great Indian artist. Uh, but uh, A.C. Blue Eagle, I know for a fact, is one of the mm -hmm. greatest among these artists. Mm -hmm. Who are some of the, uh, name some of the great Indian artists, uh, particularly thinking of the Oklahoma area? 
Well, um, I like to consider um, Archie Black on, AC Blue Eagle, and um, Dick West, Black Moon Riddles, and um, of course um, there were several others, but these are the the uh, 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 greatest artists that uh, I consider that were good artists. Isn't and Dick West now in uh, Kansas or Nebraska? Yes, I think he's in Lawrence, Kansas, mm -hmm. uh, so teaching at Haskell uh, College there, mm -hmm. Haskell Indian College. And he's uh, there teaching, I'm pretty sure. I have a copy of a tape, cassette tape, that was made by uh, uh, the University of Oklahoma uh, with Dick West. Uh, I think Dick West is a uh, one of the Cheyenne, from the Cheyenne tribe, and uh, I've seen a lot of his work, and I was, I'm always uh, interested in uh, Dick West and some of the uh, designs that uh, uh, he has uh, done. Oh, there's another artist that I've uh, uh, left out was Black Bear Boson, and he's one of the great artists of uh, the Indian uh, art field. The uh, there, there are certain things about Indian art just as there is, say, about Chinese, Japanese, and other things that are very distinctive, that, uh, uh, that, that makes you immediately recognize it as, uh, as Indian art. Uh, why don't you verbally describe what those characteristics are that, that make Indian art look different from an artist's standpoint? Well, I think that um, uh, what makes them unique and distinctive is, um, uh, I think, <laughs> what the Indian artist is trying to do today is uh, to, to imitate, or not only imitate, but to um, uh, have their work to resemble the uh, artwork that was found on buffalo hides and in the cave dwellings and on rocks and uh, teepees that were preserved and that were found uh, from uh, long ago when the, uh, the Indians did paint, when they wrote uh, some of their history and their happenings on the teepees and uh, uh, buffalo hides and rocks. And all of these had um, had a what we call a flat dimension. Uh, uh, the subject completely outlined and the subject uh, didn't have no background but just a specific design or a specific uh, subject. And I think the uh, what makes it distinctive, the Indian art, is that we're trying to more or less uh, resemble, get our work to resemble these uh, styles of painting and design that was found long ago. Um, of course, today there, there are many styles that the Indian artists uh, do in, in their work. Uh, for instance, um, I do flat work, and, uh, and then I do what you call a two-dimension with a little background, and I more or less mix my style of painting up. I, I, I'm an artist that paints in moods. Uh, I feel some sometimes like I want to paint in a flat dimension, and uh, sometimes I, I feel that I want to paint in the uh, uh, two dimension. But uh, I think that what caused the uh, Indian art to be distinctive is that most of the Indian art has this particular outlook, the flat dimension, uh, the subject outline and exaggeration in the color scheme that they use. Will this book include uh, any of your painting in color? Uh, yes, I think so, and, and uh, I'm going to get in contact with Judy Moore. Uh, last time I had uh, seen her was in August, and uh, I'm getting in contact with her and just see uh, uh, what, uh, how far along she's getting and, and just see what I'm supposed to do in order to um, help in writing this book. Do you know who will publish it? Well, she has uh, someone in mind, and uh, there's an organization in Dallas that is uh, promoting this uh, book and funding, and um, I thought, well, um, later on I'll probably get more information on this. Uh, project. The um, 
What uh, what are the fa your favorite subjects of painting? Well, my favorite subjects are um, are uh, camp scenes, snow scenes, uh, which consist of uh, teepees, uh, trees, horses, um, uh, meat racks, and uh, uh, all, all all of this, I believe, um, uh, tells a great story about the American Indian. In fact, I had the privilege of helping to set up the props for the movie that the famous Mike Todd had uh, produced, Around the World in 80 Days. Uh, we set up several teepees and used uh, uh, the Wichita Mountains as the area to set this particular prop up. And um, we had the privilege of staying in these teepees uh, while they were set up. And we had meat racks in far places, and we had... Uh, a buffalo hide stretched on uh, poles, and uh, at a distance it was a real uh, um, a camping area uh, for this particular movie. Was that where they had the Indian raid on the plane on the train? Yes, that's where they had uh, the Indian raid, where they stampede the buffaloes and stop the train. The uh, uh, can you tell some more of those experiences? That was a fascinating movie, and that Indian raid was was really great. Uh, can you tell? Uh, describe how that Indian raid was put together. Well, uh, <coughs> on that particular uh, scene, I was back at the uh, uh, the camping area, and I didn't have uh, uh, the privilege of being right there on the spot when they made that particular uh, scene. But I did uh, help set up uh, the uh, uh, railroad tracks and uh, helped set up uh, the area up and, and we drove some buffalo out in that area for the uh, uh, that particular scene and uh, of course we was moved from spot to sp uh, spot out in that area where we were filming this particular film so I didn't get to see all uh, uh, what went on in that particular scene you didn't get to be one of the Indians then on the raid no I wasn't I was down uh, in the camping area was uh, in that particular scene. The, um, did you per participate in any other movies? Well, um, no, I participated um, um, in a TV show uh, uh, which was shown on the, uh, the, Indian, uh, the NBC television network from New York City. And this particular um, segment was about uh, my paintings and about the flute music that I produced. Mm -hmm. um, and it was shot out in the Wichita Mountains here in uh, Oklahoma. And I was particularly proud of that uh, movie. It was about 15 minutes long and it was shown on the Walter Cronkite News Media uh, with a Charles Kirok on the road show. And it was uh, about the Indian flutes. Um, they were telling about the mood of the American Indian, how he could produce this particular kind of music. And not only that, but then uh, it uh, illustrated how uh, my flute music and my paintings went together. Uh, I would be inspired by the music, and I'd uh, imagine uh, ideas that I could... Uh, express on canvas or on the um, painting board that I use to paint. Uh, why don't you, can you go into any more detail on how your uh, your flute music inspires it? Uh, you, you touched on a little bit. What, uh, thinking in terms of what you told on the movie, what can you say about that? Well, <coughs> you know, I, I hear many stories about our Indian people, how uh, the places they went when they were, um, when they were, um, uh, living in the uh, 1800s, how an individual would walk off by himself and sit and listen to the birds, and he would uh, look up into the sky and see the uh, beauty of uh, God's uh, creation, such as the trees, the blue sky, and the water. And I hear a lot of people talk about this, and I uh, always wanted to exper uh, experience this particular feeling. And... Uh, and I heard uh, stories about how they would go and play the flute. 
how to go and, and uh, uh, play this music, which, which uh, they produce on the Indian flute. And uh, I hardly ever see anybody do these things. And uh, I have a great feeling for nature uh, a as, a, as an individual. And so I wanted to ex experiment, experience some of these uh, uh, feelings. So uh, many times I'd go out by myself into the Wichita Mountains, drive out there, and I'd walk into the uh, rock, and I would sit and I'd play my music. And uh, several times I went out and sit by a lake and played my flute music. And out of this, well, I visualize a lot of things. I, I think about uh, uh, what I could uh, paint, and, uh, and I believe it in, inspires me to, uh, to paint. It, it gives me um, uh, a feeling for different uh, subjects that I do on my uh, artwork. And I wanted to ex experience these things, and so I did them. And uh, several times uh, I went out into the Wichita Mountains and uh, uh, changed into my regalia and walked out into the rocks and, and sit there and uh, played my flute music. And I even sit by a stream uh, and played uh, my flute music. And I know several times while I was out there, I guess people thought I was crazy that uh, when they seen me in my regalia out there. But then uh, if uh, anybody would experience this thing, then I think that we would have more people uh, enjoying things such as this, which uh, uh, sometimes we miss out on the real true feeling of um, the nature, our surroundings, such as the trees and the rocks and, and the water and the streams. Not only that, but then the music that could go along with these things. I bet you gave the Easterners something to talk about it when they saw you out there. <laughs> yes, it, it was uh, um, uh, quite a thing. One time there was a helicopter flying around out there and, and uh, they seen me down there. I was out at Lake Elmer Thomas in the Wichita Mountains and I had my regalia on and this uh, helicopter circle around there for about 30 minutes and wondering what was going on out there. And um, all about 30 minutes after that, there's about eight, nine cars come driving out there uh, looking for me. And before I knew it, well, I had an audience there, so I just <laughs> walked off of the scene. But I, I really enjoyed myself uh, while I was out there, and I did that several times. Uh, it, it's, it's a great inspiration. I say it, it more or less cleans your soul and it uh, cleans, cleans your mind and uh, it inspires you. And uh, this is the reason why I, I do this. Um, you um, mentioned that you like to, and that Indians generally, the one thing is that they like to paint things as they were a long time ago. How do you know or how do you visualize what they were like a long time ago? Well, uh, I've seen uh, several displays in museum, museum such as, uh, museums such as the Smithsonian uh, Museum in Washington, D.C. And of course here in my own, uh, my own home uh, state, Oklahoma, in the Historical Society, I see uh, paintings that was done on hides and on teepees. And I hear stories about these, how the uh, uh, Indians had uh, did their painting. The uh, when did you become and how did you become interested in the flute? Well, in um, around 1940, 39 and 40, I heard this music during the American Indian Exposition in Anadarko, which is known. Uh, by uh, a lot of people as the Indian Fair. And it always uh, fascinated me. And I always wondered about that particular sound and that kind of a music. And not only that, but I always often wondered why there wasn't anyone, um, uh, too many people playing that particular kind of music. And it fascinated me 
So I began to wonder about it, and um, I had a feeling that I could play the flute. Now, of course, I heard a lot of stories about the flute music, that even long ago, there was a very few people played it, very few Indian people played it. And, uh, and even today, I guess there's about uh, four or five uh, American Indian plays of flute music. And uh, uh, I think one of the reasons why it's gone out of existence, and it is one of the lost arts of the American Indians, is that it, 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 it's such a chore to, uh, to make one. In order to make one successful flute, a person usually had to experiment with about four or five flutes because uh, a flute is made entirely by uh, guesswork. For instance, um, uh, well, take for instance, the Indians couldn't uh, write music or they couldn't read music. So then uh, the skill of the flute was all done by guesswork and uh, the sound effects that was brought out from these uh, flutes was had to go according to the uh, particular individual's taste in music. And, uh, and it was all done by um, uh, hand. And they, they usually use the cedar wood to make a flute out of. Where did this flute come from, the original flute? Uh, do you know how it uh, came into being? Well, there's a lot of stories and a lot of legends of the flute, and uh, each tribe has their own origin of the flute, and to me, I consider it a great history. Uh, and and uh, not only that, but I consider it uh, a great mystery uh, that is found among uh, the American Indians, uh, a mystery about uh, one of their uh, instruments, which is a, a flute. And I myself, I consider myself uh, uh, not knowing really the uh, whole history about the flute, but I'm satisfied just to know the fact that I have a desire to play the flute. Uh, and then the, the uh, Indians, the older Indians tells me that uh, you have to have a desire to play the flute. You have to have the feeling and inspiration to uh, play the Indian flute. And I know a lot of men and a lot of people wanted to play the flute but they were real unsuccessful in, in doing so. In fact, I try to teach several people to play the flute, but, uh, and I'm, I'm convinced that it is true that there's only a few people can actually play the Indian flute and master it. Um, so, um, it, it's a great mystery, and um, what little I know about the uh, flute is, is very little. Uh, because um, of it went out of existence. Did the flute begin with Comanche, or is that uh, any, uh, do you know what tribe it began with, or is it a general Indian? Well, I think it's a general uh, uh, thing among our Indian people. Uh, of course, the, like I said, uh, each tribe has their own origin of the flute. Uh, the tribes that was recognized to possess uh, flutes. And the Comanches has their own um, uh, uh, version of the uh, flute story, of course, uh, like anything else, you'll, you'll uh, get a pretty good argument on just uh, how uh, the flute ever come about. And uh, uh, I'm still making research, and it is still a mystery. And uh, I appreciate it by being a mystery because it gives me something to always trying to seek out and look for. And um, uh, one of the Comanche ways is that um, uh, they never tell actually what happened long ago because they had pride in their tribe, they had pride in the things that they'd done, and they believed that uh, this was our thing and we have respect for it. And as long as it remains in our heart, well, then uh, they're satisfied with it. And I, I'm trying to make a research on the flute. I spoke to a lot of people about uh, the flute music, and uh, they told me very little. But then it means a lot that, uh, to me that I, I have a desire to play the flute. Now might be a good time to uh, pick up the flute and uh, 
you might tell us uh, what what some of them are, and then we'll play them, and I'll. Uh, okay. <coughs> This particular flute here is made out of cherry wood, and the ornament is made out of uh, a bodark wood that sits here on top of the flute. I had the privilege of uh, uh, touring England with this uh, with this flute, and while I was over in England, I was fortunate enough to be on the BBC One and BBC Two uh, television, and in Plymouth, while I was in Plymouth, England. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be on uh, the Eastward Television Network, and um, and I also played this flute in the Cotton Bowl Stadium in uh, Texas, and had the privilege of playing for um, uh, activities such as the uh, American Folk Festival in Washington D.C. And I performed in uh, many programs throughout Oklahoma. I lectured on uh, uh, flute and uh, Indian art. So this particular flute um, I uh, perform with quite a bit because I can master it better than uh, the other two flutes that I have. So did you want me to yes. play? Uh, tell what you're going to play first, if you would. Um, This particular number I'm going to play is a, is a social dance uh, song. And uh, a lot of people uh, used to sing this during World War II. And they sung it around some of our um, Indian powwows and activities that they had. And I'll play it. because the Indians didn't ride down the, uh, the things that uh, happened long ago. So it, it'd be pretty hard to tell. But that is um, a song that was sung uh, during uh, World War II around a lot of our uh, Indian powwows and activities. Are there words to that song? Yes, um, there's words to that song that uh, I just got through singing. And... Um, well, that particular song was a love song uh, by uh, uh, the Indians, and it had a little humor in that particular song. It says, uh, <laughs> it says, I don't care if you're married, I still love you. So it must have been uh, someone's girlfriend got married on him, and he's telling her that he's, uh, he still loves her. It doesn't matter <laughs> whether uh, she's married or not. Well, that theme still is used in songs, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's still uh, in the fact today, I guess. Uh, this next uh, tune I'm going to play is um, um, a um, social dance song again, similar to the one I just got through. 
uh, plan. And um, it was uh, popular also during the World War World War uh, Two, and a lot of the people sung it at a lot of our activities. Yeah. Want to tell a little bit about some of the powwows that you have? Do you have another number that you think would be? Well, um, not right now. Okay. Well, we we might we might go to another one later. Uh, tell something about the Indian powwows and what's being done to try to preserve the uh, some of the old ceremonies and heritage. Well, um, of course, um, I can only speak about uh, my tribe. Uh, today we have uh, one organization organized. Uh, among our Comanche people, and it's an organization called the Little Pony Society, and the Comanches call it Tere Pukuna. And the Little Pony Society, the name comes from the um, Mustang breed of horses, because the Mustang Mustang was a uh, a horse with long endurance, a lot of endurance, can stand a lot of punishment, and um, uh, he was a um, uh, horse that the Comanches depended on. And this particular society uh, consists of warriors or consists of uh, men who were uh, accomplished uh, warriors or who had done some uh, deed in battle and was victorious over his enemy regardless of who he was. And uh, uh, to belong to this uh, society, then uh, this was the thing that you, you had to do to be an accomplished individual or to be recognized as, um, as an individual with um, a particular uh, accomplishment. So today they're trying to revive this. Um, of course, they, can't, uh, they um, uh, can't duplicate the uh, old original organization, but then uh, they are trying to make it unique and it is uh, 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 being recognized uh, for the fact that uh, uh, the Comanches are trying to organi organize some organization that is unique and that is original and that does belong to the Comanches. Of course, the Comanches um, were a tribe, is a tribe that doesn't exaggerate on all of its accomplishments, uh, which came to them long ago. In fact, all of this, uh, the Comanche's accomplishment uh, is never, never has been wrote into history. I can think of many, many stories that uh, that uh, has been told to me, and, and that was among our old people. And there was recorded in history, and um, so the Little Pony Society is being organized to try to preserve uh, some of our heritage and. Um, uh, th this organization they perform in uh, some of our powwows, and uh, it it got started, it uh, developed uh, there in Apache, Oklahoma, where I'm originally from, 
and uh, I've been fortunate enough to uh, to be one of the people to uh, organize this uh, particular organization, and it is unique, and um, it has uh, a lot of people that has respect for this organization, but it is from um, the old um, organization that consisted of Comanche warriors. You want to pass it in? So, um, uh, the name of it is the, Li the Little Pony Society, and it's a group of uh, Comanche men. A com has Do you a have a Comanche a museum or a historical society? Well, uh, no, uh, uh, not that I know of. I know that they have a lot of um, uh, displays of uh, Comanche uh, uh, relics and... Uh, artifacts among many of our museums, but they don't have one for this particular tribe. In, uh, I know in the eastern tribes that uh, they are, are preserving some of the old council houses and those things. Do you have such a, uh, do you have some building or something that uh, Comanches look to as their, uh, uh, as representative of their heritage like uh, the old uh, council houses and uh, of the tribes in the east? Uh, no, not that I know of. Um, like I said, the Comanches the were... The moving tribes. Right. The Comanches were, um, were people that uh, didn't believe in leaving anything behind for anyone to discover. Uh, their feeling was that this is, this is ours and uh, uh, this is uh, belongs to our people, and, and we are the human beings, as the Comanche language goes. And uh, this is not for anyone else to know but us. And uh, for that reason, well, then I believe that uh, uh, you hardly see any uh, places such as that. Of course, there may be some uh, somewhere that they uh, see as a historical thing for their tribe. Um, the, uh, there's a great number of historical societies and things being organized now, but probably more in the past two or three years than any time in the history of the state, and I wondered if there's any sort of movement under the way among Comanches to have one of their own, or among the, or among the Western, the Plains Indian tribes, uh, uh, maybe the, uh, to have one. Well, at one time, uh, uh, Around uh, Lawton, Oklahoma, there's an organi organization organized by the name of uh, the Comanche Gallery of Arts. And uh, this is one of the things that we had in mind was to preserve or to establish a museum uh, or a place where uh, the Comanches could come and uh, bring some of the things that, uh, that was from uh, the past to... Uh, bring and put on display as, as a museum like but um, I don't know uh, how far they are coming along on that uh, particular project but this is one of the uh, things that they had in mind along with this is a continuation of the interview with Doc Tate and uh, we're talking about the uh, uh, the uh, historical societies uh, over the state and what efforts, if any, are being made in the uh, Comanche area. Um, the, uh, uh, going from there, uh, what, uh, what are some of the customs of the Comanches that uh, may be unique to the Comanche tribe? Well, one of the things is that um, the uh, purity religion uh, which is called the American Native Church. Um, many of our uh, people still practice uh, this particular uh, way that they worship. And I think it's unique, and I have a lot of respect for uh, the uh, POD men of today, the ones that are trying to make an effort to preserve and um, to, um, to um, practice this particular way to worship. And the, uh, they call it the American Native Church. And I think it's unique, and I think it's uh, being pretty well preserved by some of our Comanche people. 
And not only that, but uh, there's um, um, uh, the Comanches dressed in a unique way. They were respected for their buckskin wear. And as an individual, uh, when I perform in, uh, in some of my performance playing my flute, or when I perform in programs such as the Smithsonian Festival and uh, the American Indian Exposition in um, Anadarko and some of our powwows, well then, uh, I wear the buckskin regalia uh, to be identified as, as a Comanche. And I had the privilege of um, going to the museum uh, in Lawton, Oklahoma, out there on the Fort Sill Post and uh, making research on the buckskin wear of the Comanche people. And then that's one of the things I believe that is, is trying to be uh, preserved is uh, how they uh, dressed and, and uh, we do this during some of our powwows that we have. And I do this in some of the performance that I participate in. What's the meaning of the feathers in the headdress of the, uh, of the traditional dress? Well, um, long ago, in order to wear the uh, headdress, there's, there's several different uh, headdresses that uh, uh, that you see. There's the they call uh, the war bonnet, and they call the uh, roach, which is made out of porcupine quills. There's the eagle feather, single and a double, and even some tribes wore three eagle feathers. And, uh, of course, there's the otter cap or the beaver skin cap that the, uh, some of the tribes wore. And these were, uh, they wore them for a particular purpose. Some of them wore them for ceremonial uses. Some wore them to uh, indicate that they achieved a certain uh, recognition as uh, a warrior or as a chieftain. And um, they have uh, their uh, purposes uh, to wear these. And the Comanches, they wore the eagle feather uh, tied to their hair. And uh, they wore the otter, scalp, otter cap uh, uh, skin. Uh, and they wore uh, a eagle feather plume in their uh, hair. And uh, they wore um, hair ornaments tied from uh, their um, braids. That they had and some of the uh, Comanches wore their hair loose uh, long ago, and uh, but these headdresses were uh, worn to uh, to emphasize on uh, some of their achievements as individuals. And I can only uh, talk about my, my tribe because uh, I made uh, uh, most of my research is on the tribe that I come from, the Comanches. Mm -hmm. Of course, other tribes had their purposes wearing their headdresses. Um, uh, in the late 1800s, uh, when a person had the privilege of wearing the beaver skin cap or the otter skin cap, while they were considered uh, uh, an individual that was a, uh, uh, and, and a dignified inter, uh, individual, and they were considered uh, from a prominent family, or they were considered a prominent individual. And the eagle feather they wore, they either belonged to a certain society or the eagle feather indicated that uh, they had uh, done some um, uh, deed uh, that caused them to have the privilege of uh, wearing that uh, particular eagle feather. And then, of course, the, uh, the eagle plume, uh, they wore to identify themselves as belonging to a certain society of men. And they had their uh, purposes of uh, wearing these. I'm going to pull uh, just some of these pictures that are in front, and I'm going to just tell what they are, just basically, and then let you let you tell about them and describe mm -hmm. them. And if there's anything you have to say about them, you know, as to where the uh, uh, inspiration came from, or the style, or what. Uh, uh, this one has a blue background, and it is an Indian boy with a pony. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. I described yeah. it right. Why don't you talk about this picture? Well, this particular um, uh, subject here, uh, the Indian boys to me, in fact, I have um, four uh, boys of my own, they're 
they, um, to me, they're they're an outdoor type of an individual, and uh, they like nature and they like um, animals. And even when I was a kid, well, I, I had uh, several horses of my own that I was so fond of. And uh, a lot of times when I was coming back from school and I cut across the pasture, well, I'd walk up to one of my horses and, and uh, take time out to either pet him or try to uh, catch him. And so this particular painting here, I was inspired uh, by this uh, feeling that I have for animals and that I've seen in other uh, Indian boys and then even in my uh, son. Uh, uh, a lot of people said that this, this uh, painting here looks like uh, one of my boys. His name's Edmund Wayne, and he has a regalia such as this, a buckskin regalia, and he has a horse that he rides. And I was just inspired to paint this because he gave me a lot of feeling. And a lot of times he'd run out there and, and jump on his little Shetland pony without a bridle and saddle and ride him. And he has long hair. So I was inspired by that, and I painted this. It's a typical Indian boy, I think. Uh, the next one that uh, just happens to be shown is uh, has a has a black background, and this has a boy. It looks like a young boy. Uh, no, it looks like possibly a young man mm -hmm. in a uh, uh, in a ceremonial dance. Why don't you tell us about it? Well, this dance here is a is a common around our powwow world called a war dance, and. Uh, the war dance, uh, of course, to um, our modern society is uh, nothing more than a guy getting out there hooping and hollering and jumping up and down. But then the the war dance or the dance that that, uh, that is uh, the American Indians, they go through a certain movement, a certain rhythm, and they're inspired by the singing and the drumming to cause them to move in a, uh, uh, a rhythm that... Um, illustrates these particular dances and uh, this dance here I call the modern day war dance and he's coming out in rhythm and uh, the footwork that they do is important to a lot of these dances and uh, the color scheme I use here uh, I thought uh, would be real good for a uh, black background and of course uh, as I said the traditional style uh, uh, of the American Indians in painting is uh, a subject with no uh, background to it at all, but just a subject that's in the foreground. And I have this war dancer doing the modern day war dance. This next one is a uh, has a teepee in the foreground. It's a winter scene. It has a uh, uh, is that is that an Indian woman? Yeah, I believe so. An Indian woman on a horse by a teepee at, uh, in an obviously a winter scene. Do you want to describe it and tell them the inspiration for it? Yes, uh, <coughs> like I said before earlier in the interview, that um, um, I like to illustrate the uh, camping scenes uh, because of the feeling that, uh, uh, that there is uh, within a camping scene. And this uh, painting here, I got an Indian man coming in from a hunt. He's carrying a deer, and uh, his wife is uh, peeking out the uh, teepee to see who was out there or to see who uh, rode up. And um, and I'm inspired about these types of uh, uh, subjects because uh, I think the Indians actually camp in areas such as this. Uh, among trees and then in the snow and activities such as uh, returning from a hunt actually did happen and it inspires me uh, a lot when when I can um, do a painting such as this a scenery painting and this is what you call a two-dimension painting here mm -hmm. it has background and it has um, uh, a scenery and uh, I have uh, you mean two or three uh, well, I got a. Uh, we call that a two dimension two. because all the subject is still outlined. Yes. Uh -huh. um, this uh, this next one is a boy and a, it looks like a, a small deer. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about it? It has a greenish background. Yes, I use this uh, to get my color scheme, and um, 
again, uh, I painted this uh, painting about the little boy, and he's close to nature. Uh, the Indian boy, he, he likes to go out, I think, and, uh, and uh, chase after um, a rabbit or a squirrel or even uh, trying to catch a deer. And I painted uh, this in a flat dimension, entirely no background, and the whole subject outlined to illustrate uh, the uh, uh, feeling of uh, an Indian lad, Indian boy, when he's out in uh, the creek or the woods in, in the area where he lives or where he's camping. And um, when I think of a small boy or a lad, well, then I know that uh, he's looking for adventure or he's looking for uh, an animal that he wished he could have and take home as a pet. So I painted this in a flat dimension using that car scheme. You know, I think to get pictures of you with these and get proper lighting and keep from getting uh, too much bounce back, we might do well to shoot them outside. Okay, uh, <coughs> we'll, we'll do that. Then. Uh, why don't we? Do you have any other thoughts that, uh, that maybe I should cover that uh, in your background that you feel might be of interest? Well, I consider myself um, a fortunate in the art world, and uh, there's a lot of um, uh, privileges that came my way, and um, I'm always... Uh, uh, trying to uh, capture our Indian culture to um, bring out to our society how the American Indians actually lived and uh, and I have a lot of pride in it and as an Indian artist I had uh, a lot of privilege come my way I had uh, I travel quite a bit with my artwork and I think I've been real fortunate in doing this and not only that um, I'm fortunate enough to um, meet a lot of people and make a lot of friends in this art world. And I'll always want to be a friend to uh, people who are willing to know more about the American Indian. Um, I had uh, several one-man art shows that uh, I was real thankful for. And in 1969, I was awarded the Gold Key the city of Weatherford, Oklahoma, uh, by uh, Weatherford, uh, Oklahoma's mayor, um, for being one of the outstanding American Indian artists in the United States. And uh, things such as this that uh, I consider myself fortunate, and um, I'm always trying to be humble about these things. Um, not too long ago, I was down in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I had a chance to meet J.W. Jeffers. He's one of the, uh, he was one of the co-workers to uh, uh, Oil Roberts. And I had about 15 paintings with me, and this is a great story, I think. It is just the beginning of my art career. And uh, he saw that I was uh, disappointed, or uh, he, he saw that I was uh, uh, depressed as an Indian artist. And he called me in his office, and, and uh, he asked, uh, if he would, uh, if he could uh, pray, pray for me as an individual, and for the work I was doing, since uh, he thought it was a great venture. Uh, so I told him uh, I'd appreciate it very much. And he called his staff in, and we set about 15 paintings around in a circle. And his staff come in, which numbered around uh, 12, and he prayed. And after he got through praying, he said, "Well, Doc," he said, "after this," he said. Uh, if you'll believe that you'll never be carrying this many paintings around uh, to try to sell. And he said, uh, the demand will be so great that you won't be able to take care of them. And so, do, uh, so today I really believe in that. Uh, uh, these paintings that we got right here are sold, and I'm about uh, 21 orders behind in my uh, artwork. When was that that you were there? Well, that was uh, way back in uh, 67. Uh, of course, I started painting about uh, uh, 10 years before that, and I hit the art shows every now and then whenever I had time. I used to work for the BIA, then I worked for um, several other uh, places, and uh, when I went into uh, 
uh, full time artwork. Well, then I found uh, the feel a great, a great venture, but yet um, a hard uh, hill to climb. So ever since then, when J. W. Jeffers called me into his office and, and said a prayer for my work, well, then uh, uh, I'm still trying to uh, keep late enough painting to <laughs> keep here at uh, home. Was that Jeffers or Oral Roberts who did the? Uh, J. W. Jeffers. Jeffers. Mm -hmm. He's the uh, he was the co-worker to uh, Oral Roberts. Mm -hmm. And um, one time I was illustrating art. Uh, at the Indian City in Anadarko, and I had a great audience there. It was about 75 people. And an old lady came out of the crowd, and uh, she touched my right hand while I was illustrating art, and she said, uh, you should always be thankful for your, uh, for your um, uh, talent and always give thanks to God. And, and she walked back into the crowd. In other words, she was telling me not to be, uh, not told me not uh, to let pride uh, blind me to an extent where I forget about my blessings, you know. So I um, often thought about that, what this old lady told me, and, and I never did uh, uh, see this old lady anymore. And then I had a story about uh, the flute. Uh, I had a man looking for me for several months, an old elderly Indian man, and he told me a story that... Uh, 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 what he experienced. He said that his sister was near death and was sick and uh, they had given up hope for her to survive this uh, sickness she had. And um, so he was real depressed and uh, one night as he was sitting there with uh, his sister uh, watching over her, while well, he went outside to pray and he walked uh, a great distance from the house that uh, his sister was in and he began to pray and while he was praying well he heard flute music and it startled him and he, he got frightened and he got afraid and he didn't know what to make of it or he didn't know what to think about this uh, thing that happened to him and he said he thought about the Indian boy that played the flute that was here in Oklahoma and uh, first of all, he didn't know whether the uh, thing that he heard meant uh, bad luck or good luck. Of course, a lot of our people are still superstitious, the older Indian people. So he thought about this uh, incident that happened to him. And, uh, and so he stayed there with his sister, and, and uh, gradually she began to recover. So he thought, well, maybe the the music that he heard meant good news to him and his sister so she recovered and she uh, got her health back again and so he began to look for me he said he was looking for the boy that played the flute so one day i was at the historical society doing an art show while this old indian man come up there with, with a recording to get a recording from me and he told me the story he said i've been looking for you and I've heard this uh, music, and I was wondering, uh, I wondered about it, and I was fascinated in the flute music, and it brought me real good luck, and he said, I think that uh, you have the privilege of hearing the story that I had, and he told me the story, what happened. And I thought that was a real uh, honor for someone to respect me in that manner, for playing the flute music, and it's, it's a great story, and I believed him. Well, why don't we uh, why don't we slip outside and we'll catch the pictures with the paintings there. Then I want to get something with the flute that we can catch you inside possibly and use the regalia on that. Uh, uh, this has been an interview with Doc Tate, and I'm not going to uh, pronounce that last word. I'm going to let you pronounce it. Uh, Nivakoya, it's just the way it's spelled. Nivakoya, just the way it's spelled, and we spelled it earlier. <laughs>
One, two, three. One, two, three. This is Penn Woods interviewing for the Oklahoma Living Legends. Uh, we are in uh, Altus, Oklahoma. This is uh, February 1973, and we have as an interviewee, I'm going to ask you to give me your name, and then we will spell out your last name. George E. Thomas. And uh, that's T-H-O-M-A-S. Uh, Mr. Thomas, uh, you live here in Altus. Your parents, I believe, came to, Al uh, came to Altus in... Uh, in the fairly early days, could you tell me who your could you tell me who your parents were? G. B. Thomas, and my mother's name was uh, Margie Thelma. Uh, when did your parents come to this area? They came here in 1897. You're where they came from? They came from uh, down a little town down close to Fort Worth, New York, New York, Texas. So they came to the Oklahoma Territory in uh, 1897? 1897. Father, you want this on? Yes. Father came here the first time in 1889. And uh, he took a job at any kind he was single in, taking any kind of a job he could get and worked with threshing crews during the threshing season. And uh, the first boom they had here was 1890 and 91. Wheat was a good price and they made good wheat crop. Then in 19 the price of wheat dropped down to 25 cents a bushel. And uh, you were born here in 1902. Mm -hmm. uh, what? Uh, now, what are the early, uh, now you, you were here in Altus, what was Altus like as you first remember it? Could you describe the town? Well, it was, uh, I think the east side of the square was nearly filled up. The west side of the square didn't, uh, had one building on it, Russell's Dry Goods Store. And there's two or three frame buildings on the north side of the square and uh, a few on the south side. What are the earliest things you remember in, uh, to have happened in Altus? Where'd you go to school? Oh, I went to school here at the old East Ward School Building. Is that building still here? No, it's been torn down and a uh, new one built there. Can you describe that building? Well, it is a big two-story brick heated by steam heat from a coal burner. How many students did you have? Sir? How many students did you have in school? I don't recall. We had a room full. I don't know, I guess there's 30 or 40. When you speak of a room, does that mean you had several classes in one room? No, we just had one class in a room when I first started. Do you remember any individuals in these very early days who made a particular impression upon you, either as teachers or as uh, or others you were associated with? First teacher I remember, a principal of that school was Decker. And he was a pretty mean man, so we thought. <laughs> he had to whoop several pretty bad to fight him. And that's... I don't remember my second grade teacher or my first grade teacher. He was a seventh grade teacher, I believe, was a lady by the name of Madison. That is, they built a new school building over on the west side, called it the west side. And that's, that's about all I remember about the school. 
Do you remember about the stores? You mentioned that uh, you mentioned there was a hardware store on uh, uh, frame hardware store. Can you tell? Can you describe that store? What it looked like inside? Do you remember the proprietor, the man who ran the store? No, I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, what about these other stores on the other side of the street? Can you recall? Uh, can you recall what any of them were, or is there anything you remember? Well, about the first grocery store I remember was Massey Angle. That is on the east side of the square. George D. Pendleton Drugstore was on the east side of the square, and. Uh, I don't know, there's a dry goods store on the south east corner on Main Street there, on the square. What was the drug store like then? Well, they had a soda fountain and a uh, prescription desk. That was uh, where all the girls and boys went to eat ice cream and drink Coke. What about the grocery store then as compared with now? Well, they had a clerk to wait on you for one thing. You didn't go around and pick up what she wanted. She told him what she wanted and he went and got it and get your order filled and then he checked you out and you paid him and you carried your own groceries out and they had a delivery boy that delivered groceries over town to the houses in those very early d early days in the uh uh, when you were in grade school there, that would be but during between 1907 and, 19 and, and World War I. What was the most exciting thing you remember that happened in this area? Oh, I don't remember anything very exciting. Uh, only I dropped out of school in 1918 and went to fight the Germans. And uh, my career was cut short. I served 63 days before my father told him I wasn't old enough. I was 15 years old at the time of enlistment. Went down and talked to the recruiting officer one evening. I told him I was 17. He told me to come back in the morning at 9 o'clock and he'd take me in. So I was there and away I went. Completed all our training before I was turned to duty at Freeport, Texas as a guard at the soap plants out there. And then I was discharged and came back home. Do you remember prior to World War I any, uh, were there any fires or any uh, conflagrations, any uh, tornadoes or anything that you remembered in particular during that period? Well, uh, there was a tornado that wiped out Snyder. I don't remember what year it was, but it killed several people. You didn't see that tornado, did you? No. Did you know anyone personally who was in it or, uh, or a part of our observers? No, I don't. I know uh, they had another one later that went across... Uh, the rest of the town across that that way. And Dave Reed was in that. He was a mail carrier out northeast of town. And uh, no place to get. He jumped out in the ditch and caught a hold of the fence post and hung on to that while the storm went over. And it tore up his hack, and uh, I think it, well, it pinned one of his horse's legs with the axle pinned one of his horse's legs to the ground. Do you remember when that tornado was? No, I don't recall just exactly when it was. I remember it was a great long black cloud that moved from the southwest to the 
to the northeast, and it went on and tore up Lugert and wiped it off the map nearly. How much of Alvis was? Uh, it uh, didn't so touch Alvis. Didn't touch Alvis. Mm -mm. Did you ever have one that uh, uh, didn't? Uh, wasn't Alvis uh, moved, or some portion of Alvis moved at one time? No. Oh, Alvis was first known as Old Fraser, and it is two and a half miles west of of town, and then the June flood of 1891 came along, and uh, the Salt Fork and uh, Bitter Creek met up there at Morphy, and went on down south to where Bitter Creek turned back into the river, and everything was wiped out in that strip. People, some of the people lived in dugouts, and uh, most of them did, rather. And uh, some of the uh, dugouts caved in from the wet, and uh, some of them were killed. Turkey Creek was two miles wide at Old Lusty, and there was a few drowned on that creek. That is in 1891. That, of course, was before you were born, but did you know anyone personally who saw that uh, or who was in that flood? My father was here at that time. How did he describe it to you? Well, he said that uh, they both met up there at Morrison and went south and said all the jackrabbits and the prairie dogs and things were drowned by the thousands. Very many people around? There are several. I, he never did say just how many. I don't guess he knew. Did he have any property then? He uh, lived on his homestead out there in Mile East Friendship. No, no, he, at that time, no, that's wrong. He didn't have any property here. He was just here working as a single man. Actually, this area hadn't been opened by that time. Yet. No, it hadn't been opened. Yet. Well, they, uh, at that time, people, uh, it was under Texas law, and people could uh, have as much as a section of land. And a lot of them held that much, and some 160. But he said that they bought and sold land and traded just like it was their own. Sometimes, uh, Quarter of a section of land that bring twenty five thousand dollars now would sell for a team of horses and an old wagon. Of course, the horses and wagon were worth a lot more than the land was then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I imagine. Couldn't work the land today. The um, do you recall any other instances? Uh, you, we mentioned the uh, we mentioned the tornado. Uh, do you recall any other things? Were there any fires or any? I'm I'm, I'm speaking first of disasters. We'll go into the other side too. But were there any fires or any any other disasters that took place prior to World War One? What about big events, parades, or? Uh, circuses that may have come to town during those early days? Well, during those early days, I remember, well, I don't remember too good, but I have a picture of it at home where they had a, the Woodman of the World had a convention here, and then they had a parade and uh, all around the square there. Was it a, what type of convention? Was it a national or was it state or do you know? I believe it was just a state convention of the Woodman of the World. I'm not sure about that, but I believe that's all it was. Did you see the parade? I don't remember, but I guess I did. <laughs> I know that picture shows my father in the front line. He was a... Uh, Oh, the captain of that drill team that put on the work when they take in a new man into the lodge. When did uh, 
What about automobiles? When did you see your first automobile down here? The uh, first automobile was uh, they began to come on the market, the Model T Ford, in about 1918 or 17. That Model T Val, I remember an old brush car that was before that that wasn't much of an automobile. It's the Model T Ford that they've taken over from uh, 18 on up to the Model A came in about about 25 or 6 or somewhere along there. You remember who owned the first car in Alvin? First one you saw the uh, do you do you recall the first one you saw what it felt like to see uh, to see a car? I don't uh, remember the first one I ever seen, but it was a pretty grand thing. What about the roads back in those early days? Those roads were terrible. There was no no grading. It was just a circular defense line on each side of the road. Maybe where the water got pretty deep, they'd put in a bridge or a culvert. And they'd build up to that with the uh, horses and slips just build a post to that bridge and down on the other side. And as all the work was done with horses and prisoners and slips at that time. I know the dad that spoke of at times when he was making his route, he'd be driving along in the wet spell. That ground would get so wet, we'd be driving along where the heck would just fall down to the hubs, break through and fall down to the hubs of the wheel. And the horse had to drag it on out. You mentioned that in World War I, you tried to enlist at the age of 15. What was the general feeling about the beginning of World War I uh, around town? Well, uh, I couldn't describe it. The boys were all leaving, and of course the people hated to see them go when they were drafting them. And nobody refused uh, to go that I know of. I know there's uh, one man, the Socialist Party was here at that time, and he they tried to keep their boys from going, but his boy went ahead and volunteered and enlisted and went overseas and was wounded. Do you remember any circuses that came to town during the early days or any carnivals back up there like? Oh, I remember Barnum Bailey came to town with the Pretty big circus, lots of animals. I don't remember what year. And then I believe there was uh, Ringland Brothers came to town one time and was put up out east of town where the old fur ground used to be. And it rained and it was muddy and uh, pretty disagreeable, but they had a large crowd and managed to put on their show. Lots of carnivals came through back in those days. What were they like then? Oh, they mostly had a merry-go-round, Ferris wheel, and uh, refreshment joints, and then gambling joints where you could win a cheapy doll or something if you was lucky. Haven't changed much, have you? <laughs> How about medicine shows? Did you have medicine shows? 
Yes, I remember a medicine show, but I don't. Uh, it was on down on the square, and I it was had a wooden platform built up, and I'd, they had a torch of some kind to give light at night. Did um, do uh, what about parades? Did you have any? Uh, did you have any? You mentioned that that was the Wooden of the World parade. Did you have any others? Uh, circus parades, Christmas parades. Oh yeah, every circus that came to town, they paraded around the square with their animals in cages and uh, elephants with men riding them and a big band leading them. And they had some kind of a machine at the tail end that uh, they played with, made a lot of music. It was uh, powered by steam, I believe. Talio, whatever what you call it. Talio, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you have uh, Did you have community events on ho on holidays like Fourth of July, or were there any uh, big citywide picnics, summertime picnics? I don't remember any citywide picnics, but always Fourth of July was a time for picnics. I remember one time a Baptist church had a picnic on uh, Turkey Creek over here east of town, about eight miles, and then south east of the creek. <coughs> and they transported the children out there on a wagon pulled by horses flatbed wagon jim Grouter's wagon <coughs> and they had a big big tin tank full of lemonade with ice in it drink all you want then they spread dinner right about the size of that Did you have any political picnics, uh, speaking picnics, when you had uh, elections? Oh, we had elections. I don't remember too much about them in the early day. I remember John Bailey was elected sheriff from Hedrick, I believe. He lived over there somewhere around Hedrick. And uh, I believe Lee English was the next sheriff I remember. And uh, what political figures over the years do uh, stand out to you as the uh, most interesting uh, personality? Well, the first time I ever played in politics, mount anything was. When Jack Walton was elected governor, I don't remember just when that was. 1923. But anyhow, he held a big barbecue in Oklahoma City out at the fairgrounds, and I went with some more men up there to that barbecue and just to see and uh, eat some of the barbecue. That just observing, I wasn't no part of any political party. A lot of people up there for that event, weren't there? Oh, they were sure a crowd there. Was there enough food? Plenty of food. How did the people feel? Now, this uh, uh, Walton didn't last too long in office. I think uh, he, he, he got in, in hot water fairly soon in his career. How did the people in this area, it's hard to speak of a <laughs> in general about people, but what, what did you hear down here? during the period of impeachment and uh, during the trial? Well, the only thing I know, he got in trouble. He may unmask Ku Klux Klan in Oklahoma City. They was going to hold a parade. And he unmasked them Klan members. And most of the people were in favor of that. 
And that's about all I remember about that. In favor of unmasking. Mm-hmm. Did, uh, was the Ku Klux Klan actually down here? They was quite active for a while. And anyhow, the uh, south of town one night, they caught one of Kimball's boys and tarred and feathered him. And he cut the all the on the uh, cars they just had curtains in for them. didn't have no closed in cars they had curtains and he cut the curtains on this car for so he could identify it and he did uh, go and identify it and uh, they arrested the man I don't can't recall his name right now he was a contractor around here but anyhow, there never was nothing done about it. Who was Kimball the sheriff? Was he the sheriff? Uh, it was uh, one of his. Who was Kimball, though? Did you identify him? He was one of the. Uh, I believe he was one of the Sheriff Kimball's boys. Mm -hmm. He was he the sheriff, that's right. Mm -hmm. No, he wasn't at that. Kim uh, Kimball wasn't. I don't remember who was sheriff at that oh, time. Oh, Kimball's business. Kimball was a cotton bar here for years. And Ronda Kimball's in down here for years. Do you know what the tarred and feathered the man about? No, I don't recall just what they was, what they tarred and feathered me about, but just on general principles, I think. Maybe he might have been out with a girl or two or something that they didn't like. That's about all I can tell you about the... Do you remember any other events uh, that involved the Klan? Then? Yes, uh -huh. No, I don't think that I do. I think that's the only period that had any real power in the state. Uh, had, uh, um, the uh, was it very large in uh, was it very large in this part of the country? Well, it is pretty good, uh, pretty good bunch of them. I don't know just how many, but I know one time they had a meeting over there in the uh, old city auditorium. And of course, as a boy, I had to be around seeing what was going on, and they was, the auditorium was just about full of them. Were they, they all with the robes and masks? They all had their masks and robes on at that time. We couldn't tell who that's what we were going to do to see who they were, but we couldn't tell who any of them were. Did the... Uh uh, did the move, the end of the Walton regime, or did this, uh, did the Klan phase out here pretty shortly after that? Yeah, it, uh, it just finally disappeared. I don't know when or where, but anyhow, they just, uh, they never did hold any more meetings or anything that I know of. Do you, uh, uh, do you remember any of the other, uh, we mentioned, what we got into Walton when we were talking about political personalities that you might have remembered. Do you remember any others, either on a local or a state level? Oh, I remember Bill Murray. How about him? Well, that's about all I know about. Did he come through here on his campaign? Bill Murray, I believe he did, I'm not sure. I wasn't too interested in politics. Did you ever meet him? No. Mm -hmm. What about uh, local people in Altus, uh, local mayors, sheriffs, or uh, state senators, or others who may have uh, played a major role or who may have been interesting people? Well, S.E. Hickman was mayor of Altus for a long time. I don't remember what year, but... Yeah, it was back in the early part of Aldous. 
And I don't recall the next one. Did you know Mr. Aikman? Yeah. Uh, what was he like? Well, he was a pretty heavy set man, pretty genial. Do you remember any personal experiences with him? Well, one time I was coming in from the out east of town in a Model T Ford, and I was going a little too fast when I hit the pavement. And old Henry Southall chased me down and gave me a ticket, and I had to go up and visit the mayor. And I uh, lied a little bit to the mayor. I told him that as soon as I hit the pavement, I throwed on my brakes, but I don't know whether I did or not to slow down. But anyhow, I had to go up and see him. And he let me off. Didn't find me. Statute of limitations has passed, so it wouldn't make any difference now. <laughs> uh, do you recall any other individuals in in business in town or uh, or others who you feel uh, uh, were particularly uh, interesting or who played a particularly strong role in the Alpha area? Kenny, he was in the second-hand store and a hardware store, and then finally he uh, moved over there where the Schaefer Hotel is now on the north east corner of the square, and he had a big implement wagons and implements and plow tubes of all kind. He had a big fire over there and burnt out. I don't recall who owned the dry goods store on the southeast corner of the square, but I believe it was Miller Brothers, I'm not sure. What's the biggest thing that you saw happen in Alpes uh, over the years? Maybe it's the building of a, of, uh, of a building or something, or maybe it was uh, something else. What's the biggest event that you can think of in all the time you've been in Alpes? Well, the built the courthouse, the auditorium and the city hospital over there where the city hall is now. And I worked on both of them as a common labor when they were building them. Can you recall about that, instruct uh, that construction, anything that uh, was uh, particularly interesting about it, the building? Well, most all of it was done by hand. Wheel bars. And pick and shovel. And they did use a team of horses and a slip to dig the basement over at the, where the city hall is now. And I had to follow around and load that slip and dump it for the man that had the team. That's about all of that, except out here where Bronco Hill now is, used to be a great big hill there, plumb across the road. And they finally cut that road through there. You had to go around Bronco Hill or over it. And they finally cut uh, the road down there with teams and uh, Fresnos. And I drove a team of mules on cutting that first cut through Bunker Hill. We pull the dirt all down south there and fill up that low place in the road down there. After World War One, when you came back, what did you do? Well, I started back to school, but uh, I couldn't ever adjust myself to school again, so I quit. And I worked at various jobs in 
the city. I worked down at the oil mill. I worked at the flour mill. I worked at the ice plant. And uh, I've delivered groceries for Long, who had a store on the north side of the square. At that time, I worked for the express office. I worked at never nearly everything that was uh, going on. Why don't you but talk about the cotton mill? Can you think of uh, anything about it? How did it operate then? Well, I'll have to stop and think. That's been a long time ago, but I believe it was operated by I'm not sure. They could have had electricity at that time. and they, I know they had a steam engine for a while, and they had to, they took that, they crushed them uh, seed and got the oil out of them. Took the oil out of them, and uh, then them seed would come out in a flat-like outfit with a lid on top of it where you could press it down, uh, wrap it and press it down and there'd be cake. How about the oil mill? Well, that's what I was... There you got the cotton oil mill, that's what you're talking about, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the, what about the ice plant? The ice plant was all the steam and I went, I went to work at the pulling ice, the uh, great big uh, outfit there with cans uh, four foot tall, I guess, a couple of foot wide, maybe a foot and a half. They, they put down into a vat full of water, and that water circulating around them cans somehow froze up the ice. Then you had to pull the can out by, you had a chain horse, you turned by hand and pull the can out, set it down. You let it sit there and melt before it be loose from the can it was in. Then you would take it into the storeroom and dunk it out and bring it back and Refill it. You what shape would it be then? Would it be a round or something? It'd be a oblong. I say it's about four foot tall and about that wide, something like that. I have to excuse me a minute. Yeah, it's all right. The least concern really is in um, the uh, <laughs> so let's see. We we talked about the we were we were talking about the ice plant. So the ice. Basically, have it, it, these were square or rectangular ice, and even at that time, it was rectangular. Those buckets were rectangular rather than being circular. Is that right? Yeah, they were. They were not circular. Uh -huh. They was about. The oh, I don't know. I guess it was two foot, two foot and a half wide, and about four foot tall, and. About two foot across, I imagine something. I don't remember just exactly. Did you ever drive an ice wagon? Ever which? Drive an ice wagon? No, I never did drive an ice wagon. Mm -hmm. well, why don't you talk about the dairies at that time? I know they were considerably different today. What was the principal dairy in the early days? There are dairies. I don't believe. Uh, <coughs> oh, my memory ain't too good. I can't. I know that man, but I can't call his name. Had a Lord's Dairy north of town out here where they built that new addition, Lakeside Addition. You had a lot of little dairies in those days, didn't you? With a half a dozen, eight or ten or a dozen cows, isn't that right? Well, we had that on up in, uh, back in the 30s when I moved back to the old homestead act there in 1933. We had to milk cows and sell the cream. 
I guess I had a half a dozen. And uh, we'd bring the cream and eggs to town and trade the eggs for groceries and sell the cream. Save enough money to uh, buy a couple of gallons of gas to come back to town on the next week. And then uh, finally we kept increasing it and then uh, Stephen's company down here, they went to buying milk and processing it. And they came by and uh, got me to go grade A and sell them the milk. And I uh, sold them milk up to all about 19... 52, I guess it was. How about the dust bowl in the uh, in this area? How much uh, how much of that uh, dust uh, hit this area? Well, back there in 1933, uh, 34, 35, them dust storms would come out of the north. And they'd blow for 24 to 36 hours. And the house would be plumb full of fine sand. And then uh, way back there, uh, they had what they call them blue northers. It'd be a long blue cloud make up in the north. And come down, and the temperature would drop to freezing in just a little while. And one time I went in a horse and wagon over to one of my neighbors about two mile and a half. It was a pretty warm day in my shirt sleeves. And I stayed over there a while, and then coming back home, I saw one of them blue clouds land back in the north.